Hello and welcome to Tipsy Tolstoy, Russian literature for the inebriated. I'm Matt Garasimovich, a PhD student in Russian lit. This week, considering starting a game store. <laughs> As with every week. <laughs> and I'm Cameron Lalana, international politics appreciator and future serf to the Dominion of Data. Oh, baby. This is a podcast where <laughs> me and my good pal Cameron get to unwind from our week with some Russian literature and a drink or two. This week, we're going to be reading the first half of Gazelle Yakina's Izulaika. This book won the Yasnai Polyana Literary Award and the Big Book Award in 2015. But before we get into the show, we just wanted to give a quick thank you to all of our patrons that are currently supporting us. If you're interested in helping out the show, like all of them, take a look at patreon.com slash tipsytolstoy. We put a lot of work into our tiers and rewards, and it really helps the show out. If you're not able to financially support us at the moment, you can leave us a nice review on Apple Podcasts or sign up for our email list on our website. Yes, thank you for the updates. Uh, but before we get into the reading, I have the most important question of the day. Matt, what are you drinking tonight? How do you think you would pronounce this? Vallejo? Vallejo? Oh, Vallejo, shit. probably. Vallejo? Dude, I'm going to get shit on if I say this wrong. <laughs> Okay, all right. I'm going to give you a pass because as someone who lives near Vallejo and knows a direct descendant of the actual General Vallejo or Vallejo, uh, you can say Vallejo. You, you got my permission as oh, someone geez, who's... Thanks. I'm not Hispanic, <laughs> but I am I am Filipino, which makes me Hispanic adjacent, so... <laughs> <laughs> this week, I am drinking Half Acre Beers Vallejo and IPA from one of my favorite Chicago breweries. It comes in a big can. It makes me feel powerful. It's pretty art. It's really good. What are you drinking this week? I'm drinking something far less artistic. Mm. I'm drinking a uh, something called a Speedway Stout, mm. uh, which is an imperial stout with coffee from Alesmith, which is a San Diego brewery. Sounds good. Now that I'm looking at it, it says that I should be drinking this out of a goblet, which ah. I do have, but not immediately at my side. Mm -hmm. So I guess it's a... Uh, well, I'm going to pretend like I'm actually at the Speedway and, and keep drinking it out of the can. I just know I'm glad that we both got real beers this week instead of copping out or instead of me copping out basically <laughs> well both of us yeah I, my dad last week i was talking to him and he said uh yeah i'm glad i need to get you some more beers because you had a really boring drink on the other day and i was like my dad's roasting me about the drinks i'm bringing onto my podcast where how did i get to this point in my life <laughs> honestly if your dad wants to send, wants to send me beer if he thinks my drinks are boring <laughs> you know i'll send him my address more than happy <laughs> <laughs> i'll let him know <laughs> please <laughs> uh, okay <laughs> So before we get into the book itself, we thought this might be a good time to kind of analyze the era that it comes from. Obviously, it kind of happens in the very late 1920s, maybe early 1930s is where we begin, and it continues on through World War II. And if you think about the USSR in the 1930s, the, there are good odds that one of the major things you're going to think of is, is the Great Terror from roughly 1935 to 1939, although really 37 to 39 is when you, it hits its kind of fever pitch, and that's often the era that is most heavily examined. Obviously, this book more so deals with dequalization, at least in the beginning. That's what is the catalyst for the story, as we'll get into. But certainly, it does deal with the effects of the terror later on. Looking back at this, what I, what I want to do right now is kind of... I'm, I'm trying to be careful with how I phrase this. Look at the USSR not as, as, a, as a foreign country, which is strange and ununderstandable to us, and, and take the kind of dominant, almost Orwellian view we have, and I want to. I want this to be a good chance for us to view the USSR as a living society. By which I mean, although it is definitely a popular view that uh, the Great Terror was something that affected society from the top to the bottom, and it, it's the terror that it was uh, done by the arrests and the show trials, et cetera, et cetera, that, that created like a line to keep society functioning, or at least functioning as the the you know higher echelons of the Communist Party wanted. You know that that is something that we all. Matt, have you ever seen um, Death of Stalin? Oh, many times. Yeah, great movie. Yes. If you haven't if you haven't seen it, you should definitely watch it. Very, very funny. There's a scene very early on, uh, and of course this is happening in 1952, where before Stalin dies, the NKVD, every night they're getting their lists of people, and they're going out through Moscow and their Black Marias, and they're dragging people out of their houses, you know, in mass to be tortured and, and shot. And there are definitely eras in certain places in the Soviet Union where, where this fear of the Black Marias was a constant threat for many people. Uh, that being said, um, today I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to 
present information largely taken from the article Fear and Belief in the USSR's Great Terror, Response to Arrest 1935 through 1939, which, yes, is a very unwieldy <laughs> title. Uh, it's written by uh, Robert W. Thurston. I believe he also wrote a book, Life and Terror in Stalin's Russia, 1934 through 1941, which I obviously haven't read, so I can't talk to what exactly is in it, but I suspect it's pretty similar to this article, just, you know, in a much longer book format. And this is a piece which is kind of seeks to challenge the dominant perception of this era. And before I go further, I also want to quickly clarify, because this is a debate I've run into quite a few times before. Some people, at least when I was reading Amazon reviews of Thurston's book, I saw some people calling it a uh, revisionist or essentially revisionist and i think revisionism is thrown around as an insult and yeah definitely sometimes there are there are bad forms of revision of revisionism uh, that being said revisionism or the idea of revising our understanding of history is i would say actually fairly common academic practice i mean it's fairly fairly unsurprising to be in an academic context and you have a, a historian looking at an event and saying well this is how we commonly understand it but let's see if there's actually a documentation to back that up or if i can find you know find an archive which really tells the same story so the idea of reanalyzing our view of history and, and revising it based on extant evidence rather than popular narrative i think is something that gets a bad rap but is actually fairly necessary in our way of understanding history and it should be noted that thurston here is challenging a dominant view. And this is not only in the popular sphere, but also in, in the academic context as well. So I'm not saying that everything you know is wrong. Thurston is, is absolutely correct. But I'm, I'm here to, as it challenged me, I challenge you with this idea. Oftentimes, when we are having these discussions, a lot of our information comes from relatively few sources, especially Emmy Gray uh, sources, who pretty understandably had a hard time of it. So they were definitely not writing favorable things about the USSR. Uh, but there are some things where it just goes beyond belief, like um, like the Great Terror. Um, I don't know if you ever run into this, Matt. Sometimes you'll have a conversation, and if they're usually people are not talking about the Great Terror, but they're talking about the whole of like. Uh, industrialization and deaths related to that, the various purges, the the Holomador, et cetera, et cetera. And every single time they tell you a death toll, they'll like add 5 million people. Yeah, that happened to me like literally within the last month, actually. Yeah. <laughs> I think the, the figure I was quoted was 40 million. And I was like, okay, I really hate that I'm being like, I, I don't want to be backed into supporting the Soviet Union. I just want you to know that you have like not correct figures, you know, like, it, it doesn't it doesn't discount how many people were killed, but like it definitely was not as many as you're saying. Yeah, um, I, I'm not saying that that I'm not trying to say, oh, this wasn't really as bad. That's not the point I'm trying. I'm, I'm coming in here to make the point I'm coming in here to make is that we, we don't need to rely on uh, spitballed or just kind of made up statistics in order to to condemn something. Um, we can look at the, the, the machinery of the purges and exactly how many people were were. Uh, killed in the purges, likely in the realm of around a million people, somewhere between, I've seen 700,000 to a million. The exact scholars exactly debate, and these are based on uh, obviously imperfect sources. Local archives aren't then brought up to national archives, et cetera, et cetera. But I have seen quite often stated that the, the matter of specifically the purges, this is not a complete um, of like all the major death events in the USSR. We're really talking a matter of hundreds of thousands of deaths rather than like millions or even sometimes as it's put tens of millions. And the reason why that's Im important in this case is as Thurston points out in the article, there are uneven reactions to the Great Terror as it's happening. And he's basing this on, I believe this uh, data from the Smolensk, ar Smolensk archives as well as other memoirs which are not always cited in, in at least common understanding. And he points out that for a, a large number of people, there was either, I mean, there are a variety of reactions. It's a living society and there are, are there varying ways of reacting to it. Uh, even there's, I can't remember his name, unfortunately, right now, but there is an American worker who, who stayed in Magnitogorsk well past um, the... Well, well past the Iron Curtain following, and initially they had a lot of Western workers, but eventually they kind of kicked them all out over time as Magneto Gross grew to become one of the biggest steel producers in the USSR, except for this one guy who stayed and wrote a book. He noted during this era, during these years, that oftentimes workers would accuse their, their bosses of being wreckers and even would kind of follow the popular narrative of like, well, actually, these, these arrests are happening because there are people undermining our country, so 
you know, you're a wrecker. And they would almost use that as like a, oftentimes if they're debating or having issues with their boss, that would be an accusation thrown around or uh, uh, people who early on and, and kind of you, like I said earlier, you could see purges hitting a fever pitch in uh, like spring 1937 onward, people who uh, especially because this was something that, that did heavily impact the party itself. In fact, there's, if I can go in another little diatribe for a moment, there's a, there's an old joke from this era, which Thurston cites in his article. An NKVD officer comes and, and knocks on uh, an apartment door in the middle of the night, really pounding on it, and he says, NKVD, open up. And a voice from the inside says, Comrade, you have the wrong apartment. The communists are upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes there there is a perception that this is something that's specifically happening to to other groups. Um, people express that they know it's happening, and they'll sometimes they say, "Oh, this is maybe right, this is maybe wrong," um, but this is happening to a different group of people. Even he cites some memoirs of some people who were themselves arrested or had family members arrested, and the narrative wasn't one of overarching fear so much as it was of. Well, actually, the system itself maybe was not. The system itself is working. It's just I'm the mistake. I'm the error here. And of course, for some of these people, that would of course change over time. Is this continued being the, you know, the exceptions continue not being the exceptions, but rather the main feature, I suppose. And of course, like I'm saying, this, there's an uneven number of reactions. But uh, Thurston points forth the argument that it was not one of, of universal terror, of kind of Orwellian terror, as we often think of it. Among certain classes of people, absolutely, that was something that pervaded their everyday sense, the fear of those Black Marias. For other people, maybe not so much, and that's something that changes over time, as perceptions change, as certainly you still see a great willingness to engage in um, nationalism, or uh, I don't know if nationalism is exactly the right word for the USSR, but, but you know, jingoistic support of the governance of, of the government in, in the Russo-Finnish War of this era of, of World War II. And I'm sure that you can have <laughs> difficult feelings on the same subject and again i'm not trying to put forth a oh it really wasn't as bad as as the west says kind of narrative um and but i'm trying to put forth that the idea that the machinery itself can be a condemnation of, of the stalinist system and the stalinist era but we don't need to engage in a in a simplistic view of history in order to understand it and, and in fact it, it maybe help us may help us understand where how societies function if if we are then to accept thurston's view which you don't necessarily have to. He's putting forth argumentation based on evidence. Every, people are certainly free to find contradictory evidence and make a systematic argument back against that point. But if we accept Thurston's assertions, well, then that, that creates some interesting questions of nationalism in society and the ways people react to terror in their own society, which I think are really interesting questions. I'm going to go into my political science hole. Um, sometimes we still take on this Francis Fukuyama kind of view of history of in the 90s, political scientist Fukuyama boldly proclaimed the, the victory of liberalism over, over other ideologies and, and the end of ideological history. Really, liberalism is the end point uh, of history is the argument he put forth. And sometimes we take on, not in rhetoric, but in idea, the, the notion that what exists today is, is necessarily how it must be, and things in the past are necessarily of the past. Of course, things, uh, the many governments that are no longer in existence, yeah, they're, they're pretty sensitive to the time. However, I would put forth to you uh, the idea that the sociological forces which create some features of the society are not things that are retired. They're merely expressed in different ways or not expressed for a certain time. And so actually by, again, if we, under, if, we, if we accept Thurston's view of history and then use that as a basis of analysis, that might actually get us some interesting models of understanding society, which are maybe still be applicable today because the basic forces behind the ways humans act, I don't think change all that much over time. But anyway, that's my soapbox. I'll get off it. Let's talk about much more interesting topics like uh, folklore in Sib well, not Siberia, outside of Kazan. All right, Matt, over to you. <laughs> so my notes started really detailed because, as I mentioned, we read the first two parts of four parts in this episode. And I really liked the first part, and then I didn't really like the second part in the same way, or like there wasn't as much going on in the second part. Right. I, I mean, there was definitely more going on in the second part than the first part but you know you'll just you'll see you'll see in a later interview i read of the author yakina mm -hmm. i read that she initially wrote this as a screenplay and it really shows in the yep. second part the first part is much more chock full of cultural information and in general like yes. the world that zuleika lives in whereas the second part really is more like a movie and it really feels like it the second part would have made a great movie and i was just thinking like compositionally i have some thoughts on it that i'll get to later but 
Okay, yeah. I'm excited. So the, the first part is called the Pitiful Hen, and I'm just going to kind of lay out the main characters that you have in this part. So you have Zuleika, who's about like 20-ish, early 20s. You have her husband, Murtaza, who's about 50-ish. Yeah. It's not exactly specific. He was 45 when she was 15 when they got married. That's the only concrete dates that we have. And then you have Murtaza's mother, who <laughs> is only referred to... I, I think they give her actual name, but... Uh, Zuleika refers to her as the vampire hag, which is just a funny mother-in-law name. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's not like a funny, cheeky mother-in-law name. It's like a, not the best situation in which Zuleika is is in, and that's what this first chapter kind of kind of gets at. The vampire hag gives Zuleika the name, the pitiful hen, uh, for for a couple reasons, and we'll get more into it. But you get kind of painted this picture of what what the world is, what the life is like. And it's very interesting because it's not a perspective that you get a lot in Russian literature by any means. You're getting an outside viewpoint. You're getting somebody from you get like a, a Kazan suburb, if you will. And so you're dealing with a family who are Muslim, which is not what you get typically in Russian literature. And so that leads to some kind of some interesting dynamics that we'll get to in part two. But so part one, it's laying out the world. So Zlaika is, you know, she's raiding the, uh, the the family stash, trying to get some snacks early before the vampire hag gets up. Uh, the vampire hag, uh, deaf and blind, but she has this, you know, she can sense everything with her feet and tell exactly who's walking around doing what. To be fair, you know, we as, as in our modern era can like mostly tell the members of our family walking around the house by their footsteps. Yes. Oh, yeah. Big time. Also, her her. Her pool is is um, Zuleika and Murtaza, and yeah, given that yeah. Zuleika is like a, a fifth of Murtaza's weight, I think. Um. <laughs> yeah, it's um, it's it's kind of well. I mean, some parts <laughs> some parts of it are comical, but perhaps not the emotional abuse hurled on to, and physical abuse hurled on to Zuleika. I don't even yeah, like know how to summarize this first part because so much like so many things happen. But basically, it, it it's it's customary at, at this time. I would say, generally speaking, in Russia, early Soviet Union, especially Russian Empire era, when you get to it, that when the woman gets married, that is like she becomes a servant of her mother-in-law. That's how the family dynamics work. And that's exactly what you see here. The vampire hag just abuses Zalika, makes her do everything. Uh, this this girl has done more than I had done in my entire life in like one day. In, not to mention the end of the day when Zalika is bathing her and it's not just like a bath. Keep in mind, this is like Murtaza built a whole like like a bath house, like steam. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's a sauna, sauna, everything, and it's not just bathing. It's like the whole shebang, uh, spices, incense beating people with, with birch branch, which yep. I would like, but... Yeah, I mean, apparently she does because she's telling Zuleika to, like, beat her until, basically, until she starts to bleed, and then Murtaza comes to get her, and the vampire hag says that Zuleika had beat her, and then as a result of that, Murtaza beats Zuleika, and that's pretty uncomfy. Uh, there's, like, a, a half-sex scene where Murtaza decides, you know, he's not attracted to his wife, and then they go back inside and have sex and that's kind of where the chapter ends not not a, a happy one i'd say yeah and then there's also like this weird dream sequence that the, the vampire hag has where she she apparently has these dreams that are like i don't know predictions or prophecies which very often come true historically they've been uh, about Zuleika who has had i believe four daughters who have died either prematurely or like very young this time it is about three fiery angels that will come into the the house and take her straight to hell, and this like it absolutely scares Elijah. Granted, I mean she's she's had a pretty good track record of them being right, I guess, because all four of her daughters have died, and so that's kind of the anxiety that it leaves it on. So then and then it goes to to chapter two, which is really just kind of broadly. Uh, it gives some more background into Zalika. It gives uh, more commentary on the Red Army and the requisitions that were going on at this time. Basically, the you know the Red Army could demand, or the village Soviet could demand that grain or animals or whatever could be requisitioned. And this comes on from the Civil War throughout just the period that this is set in, which is mid twenties. So this ends in an act of defiance of. So like his husband Murtaza slaughtering their cow before it can be requisitioned. 
And they, you know, they do a lot of stuff. They talk about kind of how they had been hiding grain, how they had been doing all sorts of stuff to prevent themselves from starving after their food had been requisitioned from them. Uh, in the last chapter of part one, Suleika and Murtaza, they decide to hide grain in their daughter's graves. And so they, you know, dig up the graves and hide grain in it and on their way back the red army a couple of red army soldiers catch them and interrogate them and Murtaza gets angry and swings his axe at one of them uh soldier ignatov who plays a role in the second part he shoots him and kills him not long after zalika kind of gets him home the red army slash village soviet leaders come to collectivize like basically their entire estate and zalika has to join a caravan of were called kulaks being led by the red army to leave her estate again kind of a brute summary of <laughs> this part which is like there's a lot to unpack in it which we will later in part two i i could just summarize literally as like they're just in transit to siberia yeah so it starts in in transition they the caravan is being taken they don't know where it's kind of the general theme of part two is they don't know what's happening where they're going quite terrifying especially for Zalika who I, I don't think has been really outside of their village perhaps ever it's also an interesting kind of clash of cultures really because you have the citizens of this village who are primarily provincial people uh they work the land mostly muslim etc cetera, etc cetera. and then you have the red army soldiers who are a, a lot of young uh, primarily ethnic russian uh atheists who uh certainly don't have much respect for cultural traditions that they <laughs> that don't relate to marxist leninism exactly so that's how the, the caravan ends up spending a night in an abandoned mosque on their way to wherever it is they're going. And that that's something that actually happened quite a bit at this time. You see through Soviet film and whatnot, staying in abandoned mosques or churches or other religious buildings and kind of the feeling of desecration that comes along with that for the people who are being kind of forced out of where they're going to stay in a former holy space is not something that is particularly pleasant for them. And as as they leave the mosque, Zalika looks back and she sees a red Soviet flag flying over the mosque. And a, a brief aside from what is so far a really depressing kind of, <laughs> kind of story. And and it won't get it won't really get more cheerful as we go into it. But the funniest line and perhaps line of the week, which I nominated for it, comes from this chapter, which is the red the red army soldier who the caravan gets delayed because one of the mares is a little bebe and try, trying to get some food and it stops the whole caravan for like an hour and he exclaims even your mares are kind of revolutionaries and so <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of kind of a funny moment in what was otherwise a quite quite serious narrative yeah i think it's probably one of the only funny moments in the book intentionally i imagine I would think so. I would hope so. Yeah. So the next chapter like completely breaks with what we've been doing. And it takes you to this professor, Professor Lieber, who's a German professor at Kazan University. He's a former surgeon. He's very well respected. And basically what you come to find out is that he had just a complete mental breakdown following the revolution. And he kind of lives in the past in his communal apartment, which has been collectivized and in which a lot of people now live. He ends up at the end of the chapter being picked up by secret police officers and the rest of the apartment wants to sell off his furniture. There's kind of more that happens in that chapter. I actually really like that chapter personally. I remember being struck about it just reading for the first time. I thought it was really well done, but it's it's kind of like a, a separate sort of deal the, I think what it's supposed to show is that eventually Professor Liba becomes friends or meets Zalika while they're in transit in Kazan. And it's supposed to show, I think, kind of the, the, the way that different social classes and kind of professions all get just combined into this one transitional group as they're being brought. So at this point in the story, we've got three basic characters we've been following. Obviously, Zuleika, the eponymous character of the book, uh, Wolf Karlovich Leiba, and finally Ignatov, who has been transporting all these people into Kazan. For Ignatov, he's expecting this this to be where his involvement in the story ends. He has, <clears throat> he has transported everyone back to where he's supposed to. Now he's got big plans like breaking up with his girlfriend Elona for the, his paramour Nastasia. Yeah, they go a little bit too in, too into depth on that one, I gotta say. Really, really far into depth about his love affair. White graphic. <laughs> um, 
But when he goes to see his boss at Red Army Headquarters, Bakiev, who is an old friend of his, uh, Bakiev is like, no, you've got to transport the prisoners on a train to where they're going to go. And Ignatov is indignant. He is like, I don't want to do this. This is a terrible job. I don't know how long I'm going to be gone. I have a girlfriend to break up with for my mistress. <laughs> and what he doesn't really pick up on it is Bakiev is like really, really desperately trying to get him to go. He's got like, he's like, no, Ignatov, you should... You should go. You shouldn't be here for the next three months. Ignatov is very, very um, dense, so he really doesn't see that uh, Bakiev is like clearly trying to destroy files <laughs> while this is going on. <laughs> and he uh, kind of sullenly goes off and is like, all right, fine, I'll go oversee the train or whatever. Thanks, Dad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and the next day before he, he, he goes to take off on the train, he goes to see Bakiev one more time to give him a piece of his mind. And finds that the whole building is overrun with, with troopers he doesn't recognize. And they, they're they all kind of like, who are you? And for whatever reason, I guess some amount of uh, self-preservation has just kicked in. And he's like, I'm just, you know, I'm just a trooper. I'm just walking through. I'm just delivering something. And he's, as he's going through, he's just realized that Bakiev and everyone associated with Bakiev is currently being arrested by, other mem- by members of the NKVD. Um, and at that point he decides, oh, maybe Bakiev did have a reason for sending me. I'm going to go. And after kind of a brief action scene of him sneaking out of the building, he gets on the train and takes off. For the next couple of months, this is the life of Ignatov, Wolf, and Zuleika. They're traveling on the train. Every time Ignatov tries to find a place to stop, no one will accept him. And, and he's just like, I literally don't know where I'm supposed to go. And everyone else also doesn't know where he's supposed to go because... There was never really a plan. They were just, they're moving prisoners around that they don't have the infrastructure to support. And so you get a very good sense of what it's like to be a part of the officer class and that Ignatov and his soldiers are eating very well, while Zuleika and her companions are literally starving to death. But it does show some of Ignatov's humanity. He manages to barter away some of the goods on the train to keep feeding the prisoners because he doesn't really care about them per se, but he does care about having prisoners who are alive, and I guess he has some pride in that, so he makes sure they doesn't starve to death. I guess allegedly it would be bad if you were supposed to show up with, say, uh, several trains worth of prisoners and you showed up with... Nothing? (laughs) I guess you might consider that you would get into trouble for something like that. (laughs) I mean, you probably wouldn't, but, you know, he thinks he does, so he keeps Mm -hmm. them alive. And this goes on for a number of months. They're just literally just traveling up and down, going everywhere they can go, trying to find anywhere that will take these prisoners. Eventually, after months and months and and a great number of the prisoners dying, they end up outside of Krasnoyarsk, which, if you've never looked at a map of the USSR, is deep in Siberia deep in siberia that's good that's going on a shirt <laughs> actually maybe it would be insensitive if that went on a shirt i don't know deep in- <laughs> we're going deep into siberia <laughs> please cut that <laughs> please cut that <laughs> no i won't i'm sorry that's that's staying um <laughs> and well there they meet up with this senior commander there for the the senior for the state political administrator zinovi kuznets and Kuznets is like, yeah, I've got a plan for your people. Let's get them all on boats. And they take them all into a barge. And for the most part, they're they're on. They've got one barge that fits most people. And Ignatov puts most of them underneath the decks just because he wants to make sure they don't get out. And all the other soldiers are like, are you sure? And Ignatov is really certain he doesn't want anyone to escape, like uh, some of the people did on the train, um, with the exception of a couple of important intellectuals who are all really old who he leaves on another boat with kuznets and the other important staff members okay now let me just put in here yes go for it surely they would have been aware of the events that unfolded on the titanic by this point in time (laughs) it was quite a famous incident and now that was a boat that was supposed to not sink and i don't want to give too much away here but a boat which is more or less a couple of wood planks held together by some duct tape, which is apparently what this boat was. Well, Cameron, what happens with the boat? <laughs> well, well, luckily for our heroine, uh, she's very pregnant, which Wolf Lieba is just an incredible doctor. And he like literally looks at her when they're in the train and is like, yeah, you're pregnant. And, you know, even though he's got him, <laughs> even though he's so crazy that he literally does not recognize reality, he knows that she's pregnant. She's pretty weak. They all know it at this point, and Ignatov keeps her above deck. And as Matt has alluded to, as they're traveling down the river, they hit a storm, and the boat begins to capsize. To Ignatov's credit, when everything goes 
down Shit's Creek, when every other soldier is abandoning ship, he is immediately demanding to know where the keys are to unlock all the prisoners. Not to his credit, he's also the one that locked them all down there. Yeah, I was gonna say, wasn't that the point when they were like, can you please not lock us in here? There's no more air to breathe. And he was like, mm, open the little windows. How about that? <laughs> yeah, so the dozens and dozens of people who have been brought are now all dead. And the survivors, which are literally a couple soldiers, all the soldiers who are above deck, Ignatov and Zuleika, um, wash up on the shores of the, the river and they're picked up by the other boat with Kuznets and the five others who will now become a big feature of this story, who are mostly Leningrad intellectuals. They finally arrive at the destination point. When they get there, Ignatov is like, hey, Kuznets, where's the prison? And Kuznets is like, well, you're going to build it. And then <laughs> Ignatov is like, what? And then Kuznets books it and just leaves Ignatov with a gun and some ammo and not very many instruments for, for survival because they were all in the boat that capsized, just on the banks of this river, very far, like, many 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 miles outside of krasnoyarsk which is already in the middle of nowhere just on the side of the river it was like all right good luck i'll be back in a couple of months and ignatov who is now surrounded by all these people who have been taken from their homes and and had a lot of their family and friends liquidated or left behind uh watch ignatov <laughs> break down and start shooting at kuznets which frankly given everything kuznets could have done about that pretty pretty magnanimous that he does he just chooses to forget that incident oh yeah but uh yeah that, that is that is where part two ends uh, ignatov breaking down as he's been left behind with everyone he was supposed to liquidate it happens it really does it, it does it, it really happens to ignatov mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if i could summarize the entirety of this part of the book yes there is a line in part early in part two which it doesn't really translate well to English, but Zuleika is sitting in the train wondering where she's going, and basically the only thing that answers her is the sound of the train itself saying, where, where, there, 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 there. I like that part. I like that one. It's good. In Russian, the, the line would be like, she, she heard the train saying to her, kuda, kuda, tuda, 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 which sounds more like a train moving, but it's a, that's basically part two. <laughs> mm -hmm. Where, where, there, there. As you said that, like originally... Towards the beginning, I, I think that this would have been a really interesting screenplay. It, it actually, when you said that, it kind of made more sense to me. Mm -hmm. it, it felt like when I was reading this, it was, it felt long. But then I had to kind of think to myself, if I was in the situation of the main characters, like, a, you know, it probably also felt pretty freaking long to her too, not knowing right. where she was going so many miles from home. Husband's dead, just kind of going along with where she's being taken. Right. And so in that sense, I'm like, okay, compositionally, I, I would have rather have learned more about the first part of the story, but just like, it, it was really interesting that like, just as you were getting into it, she was like, no, I'm going to cut you off in, it's just collectivization time. Yeah. And I'm going to drop you like right into that story for a while. Yeah. Which really makes sense because part one is very much, it, I mean, it takes place over the course of maybe two or three days. Mm -hmm. As as you go through Zuleika's life and you begin to understand the context, which is fascinating, and I want to talk about it in a bit, but part two really is just a series of set pieces. Kazan, the train, at set of Krasnoyarsk, the boat, the, uh, well, the side of the river, really. It's a series of set pieces. And, and a lot on the train. A lot, lot on, the on the train. train. Yeah, lot like on the a train. long time on the train. Yeah. I skipped the whole part where they have a prison escape. Yes. But, which doesn't really matter all that much in the, in the grand scheme of things, but. Not really. A lot of very boring long pieces broken up by a few moments of excitement like mm -hmm. a movie perhaps mm -hmm. yeah but i, okay, I want to talk about the first half of this book because i think this Please. is this is really what draws a lot of people to this book and it's what drew me in and you know like you mentioned at the very beginning zuleika is stealing uh, uh sort of like an apple there's not really snack. a good snack yeah i was yeah. gonna say like fruit by the foot it's <laughs> you know the old Soviet fruit by the foot <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like dried apple extract. So it it's <laughs> that's the closest comparison I can think of. And at first you think that's just because she's hungry, but as you l later learn when she is uh when she and Murtaza are hiding the grain in their daughter's graves, she offers up that that apple extract basically to the spirits of the Urman. And the Urman is the the forest, which has given new life is not just the forest, but it's just like an impenetrable wall. You don't go in and you don't leave. Can we talk about the spirits? Let's talk, talk about the spirits. About spirits. Let's talk about the spirits. Well, she offers it up to a spirit, and you begin to realize please. there's a whole cultural life here. And and Matt, let's talk about the spirits because we've been oh, we've been dying to talk please. about the spirits. 
I need to let the spirits out. I've had so much to say about them. This was the first thing that actually attracted me to this book when I read this, because please forgive me, Professor, if you are listening to this episode. You're probably not. But uh, my freshman year in my undergraduate, I took a class on Russian culture and it was taught by a folklorist. And I was a freshman, so I was like, I'm not going to do these readings. Uh, And then it's haunted me for the rest of my life because I'm like, oh, that's actually super relevant to Russian culture. I wish I had done the readings. (laughs) Um, (laughs) and so basically in Russian culture as a general broad whole there is this phenomena that had happened where in 988 when Rus was Christianized by Vladimir it didn't happen all at once like converting pagans isn't an easy thing and so what ended up happening was there's a lot of pagan superstitious elements that are left over in the culture from when that Christianization attempted to happen. And that is in like the kind of dominant cultural side of Russia. Like the, that is a thing for the ethnic Russians. And so I did not know that that was something that had also, that is also carried over in the non core part of Russia. So we get this narrative that is very much on the periphery of Russia, which is of course fascinating in its own right, but you still have this dual belief which is, that's the like term. I don't know who coined it, but it's like very prominent in scholarship and has been forever. Um, And so like you get this kind of continual dual belief even in the non-core areas of Russia. And I have like passage after passage after passage underlined, whereas Laika is talking to forest spirits and all sorts of spirits. And she has all these sorts of superstitions which are not part of any religion they're just kind of vestigial pagan beliefs essentially and that was like i don't know i found that absolutely fascinating at the same time that she could be praying to god she could also be praying to a forest spirit like it was just fascinating yeah and she's kind of describing to you what is the characteristic of this forest spirit is it friendly is it not and she's kind of acting different ways to make sure she doesn't offend Mm -hmm. this forest spirit so it can watch over her daughter's graves and it's really interesting to see that in action of just uh, not only the, the mere existence of the belief, but with the way that people act given the existence of that belief, especially when you need to rely on that belief for something. In this case, protecting her daughter's graves. I had to, I had to do my dual belief thing. I just had to get it out there. No, I, I thank you. I, I've been wanting to talk about that because that, that is also what drew me in when you recommended this book to me. Um, just we, we, you and I, I mean, maybe I can't speak for your reading habits, but it really focuses so much on European Russia. It's not, it's not like by choice. It's more by design. It's just like, these are the big authors you have to read. Yeah. And so that's who you read. And you're like, oh yeah, all of Russia is just like, oh, there's this like vestigial pagan thing for the Christians. That's weird. And then you get to like outside of Kazan and you're like, oh wait, that also is a thing for non-Christians as well. That's really interesting. Uh, and this was like the first thing I had read that was, yeah, like as I'm thinking about it, by like not a Christian author from like Russia, I think. I mean, obviously they're like atheists, of course, but like mm-hmm. I'm not trying to imply that like atheists work within the Christian mindset, but like the ones in Russia k- kind of do, like kind of, sort of. Yeah, yeah. No, it's just I I just love reading this for that reason. And when you go to if you ever talk to a Russian person who's like from Russia, they might like get really proud of like. Russia is one of the most diverse places on Earth, and that's technically true. There are 186 different ethnic groups in Russia, which, yeah, (laughs) I know, more than you thought. That being said, it is not like all those groups just live all together. They're actually quite separate. It's really more reflective of how large Russia is rather than how, you know, diverse, like, each individual town or city is. European Russia is pretty dominant by ethnic Russians, ethnic Latvians, you know, Ukrainians, et cetera, et cetera. And then you have large populations of Muslims who are kind of more so in, um, well, southern Russia and then large populations of Buddhists in, in more so eastern Russia. It is really diverse, but it's not like they're intermingling. But that does mean that there are many, many stories of many people who are acting from a non-ethnic Russian perspective or ethnic you know, like European ethnicity and that there's a lot of stories there, which we have, uh, I have not read. And I think it would be really fascinating to dive more into. And I, that's why part of the reason why I loved reading Zuleika so much. I think that's kind of what makes it a really important book to read. There's a lot of modern literature that I read where I'm like, 
eh, this was a fun story, but I'm never going to recommend this to anybody. But this is one that I could recommend to like mm-hmm. literally anybody. <laughs> like it's both a really, really interesting story in the sense that it keeps you flipping the pages. And it's also interesting in the fact that it is really culturally telling to not just like modern Russia, but it also it, it does some interesting things where it flips the traditional Russian literary canon on its head. And in, in the sense that I, I think a lot of the there are a lot of 19th century Russian authors who they will go to the Caucasus or like non core regions, basically not Moscow or St. Petersburg, and they'll be like, oh, isn't this weird? They say words funny. Or like, you know, like they don't they don't speak Russian. That's not their <laughs> primary language, which is the case in Zlaika, where she has trouble understanding the Russians. And so it's a complete flip on its head where you get someone who hears Russian and she's like, I'm sorry, I don't speak Russian that well. I don't know what you're saying to me. And they're like, you liar. And... You know, yeah, it's all fun and games when they get to go to another region and, you know, gamble and play around. But, um, you know, when they're moving somebody halfway across their empire, all of a sudden it's a <laughs> it's a huge issue that they don't speak their language. I think there's like a lot to talk about here. I don't even I, know what to address. I kind of honestly. agree as I was we were kind of summarizing that normally you can take a clear sort of yeah. approach to just a summary of what happens. And, and I think that's kind of the fun part. Well, right. I, I don't know if fun's the right word for this book. One of the parts that makes this book distinctive is the fact that you can't take just a clear summary all the way through it because it kind of flashes back. Like, it it makes this character who's already sympathetic even more sympathetic as it goes through it by talking about her history, where she's come from, and then just placing her in this completely foreign situation and there's a lot of features of her character which i find so fascinating Mm -hmm. but unfortunately i can't talk about until next week um because it really made me reflect some of the ways that i me and the people i relate to uh, well i don't want to spoil it but we'll get into it more next week but i don't know if you picked up on this and maybe this is just me projecting way too into it but it almost felt weirdly like um a, a sort of adaption almost of the traditional russian novel where you really had like it's really kind of about family lines and you're like following mm. five different families and you've got all these intricate details. And that's kind of true here where you have a bunch of different characters in their own lives and you've got to follow them, but it's not about the families and the social status. It's about right. them being thrown out of all of that. And, you know, you've got Zuleika and Wolf and uh, Ignatov and later the other members of the, uh, the, the Leningrad or the Petersburg uh, intellectuals who enter the story who are now thrown out of that but they all have their own narrative and relationship where Zuleika is you know a peasant from outside of Kazan who is just trying to live and not go into the Irman too deeply and and have a kid Wolf is Wolf still thinks it's like 1915 so he's just having a good time and Ignatov is like trying to ride high and cheat on his girlfriend with Nastasia and inadvertently avoids getting liquidated like Bakiev who is really just trying to look out for him and, and there's so many interesting plot lines that will be combined and really in part two begin to clash sort of, or at least they will begin to interact with each other really more so in, in forced development in each one. And it mo- really moves from a, a descriptive phase of what is life like for these people into you're in a forest together when he has a gun. All right, let's <laughs> let Lord of the Flies happen. Here we go. He's made it back to Lord of the Flies. <laughs> he swore he wouldn't. <laughs> I've never left Lord of the Flies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. As is often the case, there's a lot more we could unwrap. Unfortunately, we only have about an hour. Uh, so we're going to wrap up here for now. Uh, of course, you should follow along next week when that we get to the really the apex of the story. And there's so many features which have been set up this week which really come to its conclusion uh in in the next chapters and it's just it's it's chef's kiss. The the conclusion of this novel is really really interesting and it's it after I read it the first time, I like I stayed up to like 3 a.m. before I had to work and was just sitting there thinking after I read this novel about <laughs> what the way I related to people in my life and in kind of the commentary this novel brings to that. So even outside of just being good good um, Russian literature, it's just good literature in general. So uh, stick around for next week when we cover parts three and four of Zuleika. Yeah, I can't wait to finish that. I, I've been looking forward to finishing this book for a really long time. Before... We wrap up here, Cameron. On a scale from one to Yeltsin, I gotta know. How drunk are you? Okay, so maybe it's because this beer is 12%. Ooh. Maybe it's because um, I was covering someone else's shift, so I was alone on desk for the last, uh, last like, eight hours, and Ooh. I couldn't go get dinner. Um, but 
some combination of those two facts has left me probably at a pretty solid five to six here. Mm. Um, uh, I was I want to make a joke about someone in the book, but honestly, I don't think anyone in this book really drinks. Um, Wolf really loves coffee, I guess. If you're you drink like five or six cups of coffee, <laughs> that's about where maybe I'm feeling. I don't know. How about you, Matt? I'm I'm probably quite similar. The spirit that I got is just quite good. So I've uh, I, I I've chugged on a couple. I've been enjoying it while I've been chatting about this book. Nice. I've, nice. I've enjoyed everything we've covered on the podcast, but I've enjoyed this perhaps more than <laughs> some of the others. Even outside of just being like important literature, this is just really enjoyable literature. It doesn't have to be a hard read. Yes. It's not something where you sit down and you're like, I am reading literature today. You can just be like, I'm going to read this book and it will still get you something. Absolutely. I could ask you what we're going to be reading next week, as per usual, but I've already pitched next week, so maybe that would be just wasting everyone's time. Good point. But, um, yes, next week <laughs> we will be reading <laughs> like a part two. Well, technically parts three and four of the book. We'll be finishing the book to the end, and you will be able to hear our thoughts on the conclusion of it. So stick around and, you know, let us know what you think on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. We're there. We're everywhere. What are you going to do? I'm super glad that um, uh, one of our drunker episodes has been in a book with no like clear intellectual line for us to follow and just a bunch of different interesting small features. Would you like some thoughts? Would you like some thoughts for an hour? Here they are. <laughs> <laughs> and there they go. <clears throat> Before we let you go, we want to extend a sincere thank you to all of our current patrons. Jeff, Janice, Anne, Emily, Jesse, Madeline, Alex, Daniel, Paige, Darren, Lou, Gary, Daniel, Jack, Alex, and Roland. Ooh, just about the end of my first breath there. <laughs> Podcasting isn't free, and grad school definitely does not pay very well. So if you're interested in joining with our current patrons to keep the show running, take a look at our Patreon at patreon.com slash tipsytolstoy. The music used in this episode was Soviet March by Toasted Tomatoes. You can find more of their stuff on toastedtomatoes.bandcamp.com and also on YouTube under the same username. If you're looking for other places to find us, you can also follow us on Instagram at Tipsy Tolstoy Podcast or join our email list on our website, tipsytolstoy.com. You'll hear from us again soon.